Web3 Unpacked is proudly published by Movement, a leading design consultancy that specializes in Web 2 and 3, strategy, design, branding, creative content development, and content marketing. We help companies ensure that their brand and business remain differentiated and competitive in a rapidly evolving digital landscape. To learn more, please visit mvmt.media. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Web3 Unpacked. Today, we're doing something a little bit different and focusing on a topic that we should all be paying attention to and perhaps sometimes don't, and that is the world of crypto accounting. And today, we have Patrick Camuso of Camuso CPAs. His firm of CPAs and advisors help digital asset investors and businesses navigate the Web3 crypto accounting space. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And um, you and I were chatting before, and I think we're probably going to have to do a couple of sessions together uh, because I know I have a thousand and one questions, and I know our audience is probably curious, and the info that you have has already enlightened me a bit. Uh, made me a little bit more cautious, if you will. Um, and like I said, we're going to have a lot of questions for you, but we'll probably break it into uh, several chapters here. Definitely, but definitely. one question I ask all of my guests in the beginning of the podcast is, how did you get into Web3 or crypto? How did you get into the space? Sure. Well, it started for me, I guess, back in 2013. That's when I read Satoshi's white paper. Back then, I got involved in it personally. Um, then I was also working in the big four in the investment management space, doing a lot of accounting for larger mutual fund companies, private equity funds, hedge funds, where we were dealing with large unstructured data sets that we had to analyze from a tax perspective for tax reporting and accounting purposes. So I sort of got this early exposure to Bitcoin and the concept of Bitcoin and decentralization and um, also was sort of building an accounting background that really lends well to what is needed from a crypto accounting perspective. And um, back then I told a lot of my friends about Bitcoin and um, just started really getting tax questions on it during you know the 2016 timeframe and realized the huge opportunity and need in this space for experienced accountants that can help their clients in terms of interpreting the tax code related to their transactions and also accounting for it. So that's how I found myself professionally doing it in 2016. Um, back then it was mostly people purchasing Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then as you know, um, you know, we had the ICO craze, then we had the proliferation of different blockchains, um, D DeFi, NFTs, and then Web3, which we're at now. So. I've just been growing with the space and um, that's sort of my background on how I got involved in it. Awesome. Yeah. It starts with that Satoshi white paper, right? That, that yeah. did it for me. Uh, <laughs> went down a rabbit hole and uh, started investing and mining and doing all sorts of stuff thereafter. And, you know, it accumulates, you know, you sit on this stuff, you forget about it sometimes, or now everyone's very active in the space, uh, trading, using different services, uh, exiting, uh, exiting, uh, you know, um, crypto currencies into the fiat currencies. Uh, it's moving pretty quick and we do need to, okay. to keep up on all this stuff. So, I mean, you know, another, before we get to jump into kind of the nuts and bolts of, of crypto accounting for you personally, and yet just another question I ask our guests, what is it, what does web three mean to you personally? you know, outside of accounting, perhaps. Sure, sure. Um, well, Web3 to me is the next iteration of the internet, but this new iteration is going to be decentralized and largely based off of the blockchain technology, which I believe can take a lot of the data and power um, that's somewhat centralized now and move that more towards an individual's perspective. So that's really what Web3 represents to me is just sort of the next progression of the internet. And it basically is gonna encompass how we interact socially and um, you know financially and in a business sense as well. And it's just going more towards a decentralized nature. Um, decentralization is the future. Um, and it is, you know, like you said, 
you know, it's the next iteration of the web, but it is the trusted web, right? So it's a very interesting type of scenario. Um, so, you know, you're pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter and other, other channels, and I tune in, and one of your posts recently sparked my imagination a little bit. And, you know, as for this post, you, you know, could you answer this question yourself? Do sure. you think the IRA uh, understands crypto and taxation uh, and crypto in general in this space? Yes. Well, I do believe that the IRS does understand cryptocurrency and digital assets. You know, you see a lot of headlines right now that are sort of complaining about the lack of some guidance. And of course, I'd like to see better guidance, but I do believe that this is an area that the IRS is focused on. In fact, you know, I've been covering for years how the IRS has been increasingly focusing on this area. Um, for years, you know, they have international agreements for data sharing between different countries. They've been doing John Doe audits, collecting information from different different exchanges. They've partnered with multiple different um, data analysis and accounting software providers such as Taxbit, such as Chain Analysis. They currently have, <clears throat> excuse me, they currently have requests for proposals out right now looking at new technology solutions. Um, so they're very involved with this space. They were at cons consensus this year. I, I remember seeing that getting reported. So they're very focused on this space. And I think it's a mistake for people to think that, you know, the IRS doesn't understand crypto. They're just too far behind or they don't care about it. <clears throat> this is a huge potential source of tax revenue. And it's, it's widely publicized that the level of collective compliance is fairly low. So it's only natural to assume that the IRS is gonna view this as an opportunity. Um, so yes, I do believe that they um, understand crypto. And I also think it gets, there's a, even a further point to make is that um, a lot of the ambiguity where it does exist in the tax code related to crypto, doesn't necessarily benefit the taxpayer. Um, I would say in most cases, it's not going to benefit the taxpayer. It's almost always better for you as a taxpayer to have clear guidance and clear standards to, standards to work with. Otherwise, we need to lean towards taking a more conservative perspective. Um, a good example of that is some of the um, you know guidance that recently came out with, the, with staking. Um, there's a lot of people that were taking a more aggressive position related to that. And you know it turns out not to, not to that it's not going to work out for them in the long term. So I do believe that the IRS understands crypto. And I think as they continue to provide additional guidance, people will see that this gray area was not working for them. It's working more against them. And one other thing that I'd point out too, is that, you know, the blockchain um, is not anonymous. At least most blockchains aren't anonymous. They may be pseudonymous, but all it really takes is to tie an identity to a blockchain address, and then you're going to be on the hook for all the transactions and tax, tax liabilities associated with those transactions. And as you start to see the IRS for years now collecting data, most recently we saw them do that with Kraken. They're collecting all that exchange data. They're, they're seeing where all the transfers are going, and they're, and they're um, using solutions like Taxbit, like chain analysis, like others that they're partnering with to start to calculate and um, account for these transactions themselves. You've brought up a couple of interesting points and the, the, the key word for me is ambiguous or gray, right? Um, <clears throat> I wish there was more guidance around this. Um, I wish that it was more upfront in the tax, the actual tax documentation. Um, I think that's par for the course with regulation and legalities within yeah. crypto. It's very ambiguous. Um, uh, you know, they're not sure they don't want to overstep or understep, uh, which is totally understandable. They got they've got to do it right or they have to reverse legislation yes. and um, other kind of taxation laws and, and rules. So get it right first. So I, I totally exactly. get that. But getting it right first, I really agree with that. 
because yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I, I, a lot of people are critical of the SEC right now for moving so quickly, and the IRS is moving slower. And I think there's, you know, there's pros and cons to it. Like I said, the gray area leaves some taxpayers in the dark in some regards. But moving too quickly in terms of creating new tax rules around crypto can have unwanted effects, such as the fact that, you know, we've recently seen NFTs get included in the definition of digital assets. That right there, like such a simple thing, creates a lot of tax ramifications that maybe necessarily weren't seen when they created that definition. Now you see these broker requirements. Is the IRS going to require anyone selling NFTs to fall under broker requirements for reporting NFT transactions? That's not really in the spirit of those regulations, but now it's included in the definition. So moving too quickly can create just more of a conundrum at the same time. So they, they, they you know, they have to balance providing guidance with the fact that this is a developing asset class. Um, it is brand new. So there's, you know, there's, there's a lot to consider there as well. Uh, really good points, uh, Patrick. Um, and I, I, frankly, on a personal level, I wish they would reach out to folks like Brian Armstrong from Coinbase and, and his team um, and really kind of work together to kind of lock down some of these, uh, you know, rules and regulations and, and taxation information uh, together. You know, there's so many resources out there, so many exchanges and people leading the, the industry that do want to help the government. They do. Um, this is not some nefarious, you know, Silk Road thing that everyone thinks <laughs> some people think it is. Um, there are people who are really active in this space that want good outcomes for both sides of the aisle, um, including myself and you. Um, so, you know, getting into a little bit of the basics, right? Because, you know, I I'm not an accounting person, but much like yourself, I started very early on. And by default, I had to teach myself what is money, what is sovereignty, and what is, <clears throat> you know, what is finance, right? I really had to understand it. And I've gotten so much further along uh, for myself, but I also have to go back, especially with accounting, and I need the basics. So really from a raw form, what, what do I need? To, to start recording cryptocurrency transactions on my returns every year. Yeah, so I mean, to get started, you need to start with your raw transactions. So you wanna be ideally sourcing that data throughout the year, particularly from the exchanges, because what I've seen a lot is exchanges go defunct for a variety of reasons, and you wanna ensure that you have access to that data. So number one is you wanna download your records from each each exchange of course you know there's many accounting softwares out there and a lot of them will allow for api integrations with the exchanges to import your data i still recommend downloading the source data on a periodic basis for that reason that you know the data the data may not always be there and also there can be inconsistencies between um the data in api will pull versus the source data from the exchange so we like to pull both sets of data so first we want to get the data from each exchange and then we want to get all of your public um, wallet addresses for your non-custodial wallets and then depending on the type of activity and the blockchains that you're on we want to use the best api available to pull those transactions from the blockchain and start to build the start of a sub ledger um now the problem is is that all of this data that we're getting isn't going to be in a standardized format for or any standardized format definitely not for tax and accounting purposes so really we want to try to get the best data sources possible and then work on properly analyzing and categorizing those transactions for tax purposes and there is somewhat of a manual element to that depending on the types of types of transactions that you have and the protocols that you're investing in but um a lot goes into just getting this data what I see a lot is when people are working with CPA firms or they're working with softwares, they'll just sort of turn everything over to them and they won't save a copy of their own data. And then time can go by and they'll need to get get that data. And you know, you can get put in a scenario where you're held captive by a software 
or captive by a CPA firm where they have all of your consolidated transactions and or your, your ending cost basis data and you're and you don't have a copy of that and now you're basically married to them versus being able to possibly switch providers whether that's on a service provider level or on a uh, software level it's a lot to take in and you know is there like i, I know you're saying um, exchanges like Coinbase make it pretty easy to kind of download your your accounting yeah. information every year. So yes. that's great. You can share it with your accountant. But now what happens when, say, you know, folks like myself who are um, interacting with different Web3 uh, protocols and products uh, online through wallets, right? Yeah. So some money is dripped out into, you know, the Polygon uh, environment or Solana for that matter, or whatever it may be. And maybe it's a, an investment type of transaction, yep. or maybe it's simply just buying a service or participating in a community. Um, how does that work? Is it different with wallets? Do you have to download yeah. information and transactional info from wallets specifically? Yeah, so with the wallets, we would start with your public wallet address. And then we would pull that data down with an API from one of the many accounting softwares. We, we want to select the best API available depending on the blockchain and the availability that you know any, any one of these can offer in terms of covering specific blockchains and also the nature of your transactions as well and just get the best starting data source. Now, you know, there's not any API or any software that's going to be able to go and download your wallet activity and just basically automatically calculate it for you. And it's just due to the overall format that the data is coming from the blockchain. There's going to be issues that, you know, it can vary based off of what you're transacting. And if it's a DeFi protocol, a lot of, a lot of the transactions just aren't going to be reported appropriately when we use the accounting API, there may be two assets that you're pulling out of liquidity and it's only showing one of them, for instance, or if you're purchasing NFTs, we, there may not be pricing data applied to the purchase, or it may just even be shown as a transfer. So a lot of the data that we get from these APIs is sort of gets us like halfway there or 75% there or 80% there, depending on the particular client. And then we want to, start with that data set and start investigating those transactions and tracing them through the blockchain, making any updates to that as appropriate in order to get an actual um, good sub ledger for every single transaction that took place that represents everything from a tax and accounting perspective. Becomes this kind of really kind of an intricate web where, you, where yes. folks like yourself uh, and teams of accountants have to rely on third party APIs and software to kind of aggregate this uh all this information from the far corners of the the web three i should say yes. um so yeah we're gonna have to kind of dig into that a little bit more that kind of gets into some of the more geekier territory uh you, you you need to be very careful just understanding like these these softwares that you that you do go and download your wallet data into they're not going to be plug and play and you're and if you're looking to work with a cpa firm you need to really um, dig deep into what is their process in terms of their ability to trace and track transactions through the blockchain to update any of the transactions that are taking place that are incorrect, that they're not just basically like plugging it into the software, printing you out, printing you out the reports and sort of sending you on your way. It does take a lot of, um, a lot of tracking and tracing these transactions that aren't getting reported appropriately. And it's something that I see get overlooked a lot, along with some very important due diligence steps as well. So I think it's important to understand that, you know, you're not just going to sort of plug this into any software and get the right, um, the right result out of it. It's going to, it's going to be a process of appropriately categorizing and reconciling everything. Interesting, Patrick, um, because if, if I'm hearing you correctly, there could be CPAs out there that, or firms that will tell you, yes, we can handle all of your transactions, but they may want you to aggregate all of that information personally and hand it to them. Whereas they might not have the technology or the know-how to actually extract that kind of buried 
uh, accounting information, correct? Yes, that's correct. They may look for you to do it, or you know, they may take this on and 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 think that a software has capabilities that extend beyond beyond its needs. And it's not something that is necessarily going to be readily apparent unless you're really digging into things or really applying um, due diligence to to scrutinizing the portfolio. So you know, you you need to make sure that they have this process of they're not just sort of plugging and playing. Um, like when I'm in, when I'm hiring new employees from in, into my firm, um, oftentimes they'll come from other firms, and some some people that I interview, even though they're crypto accountants, can't read transactions on the Block Explorer, which is a huge red flag. So you know. You really want to avoid people that are that are just like blindly plugging things in and not not understanding what's what's really going on at a, at a deep level. I think that's so valuable, uh, Patrick, and thank you for kind of bringing that up because you think just because someone puts it on their their website, you know, they're going to do right by you, but you really have to do your homework before you actually start doing this stuff which I personally need to do. Um, now, for, again, staying a bit high level uh, for this uh, broadcast, how is crypto tax? Is it a cap gain? And, and what, are, what are the percentages there? If well, you know, there's many taxes that could apply to a crypto transaction. Um, most of the time when we're talking about crypto taxes, you're going to be thinking of someone that's buying or selling a crypto. So when you purchase, say you purchase Ethereum and it's at $2,000, the day that you purchase it would set and the, and the price that you purchase it at would set your cost basis in that Ethereum. Then fast forward, say you hold it for three months and it goes up to $4,000 and you sell it, that would be your proceeds. So then we would take the proceeds minus that original cost. And that's how we would calculate your gain, your gain or loss. Um, so then what tax will get applied to that gain or loss is in, in terms of a percentage that will basically depend on how long you held that asset for. So if you hold it for a long term, which is over 365 days or over a year, usually it's going to get taxed at 20%. Um, if you hold it anything under under that, it's going to get taxed at short term rates. Short term capital gains rates is basically going to be your ordinary tax rate, which it can vary from taxpayer to taxpayer, but usually it's going to be somewhere, um, you know, 20 to 40 percent, 20 to 37 percent. Wow. And the, it, so if I'm hearing you correctly, the longer you hold it and then say you exit the market and it's in fiat now, um, <clears throat> the lower the actual cap gains could be yes Is that's that correct? true now in terms of holding your assets in crypto one huge thing i see blow people up during every single crypto cycle is they'll either be trading altcoins taking profits into ethereum or they may be selling something and getting paid in ethereum and you know they sort of get high off the bull market a little bit and you know they just think the numbers are going to go up forever and you're incurring tax liabilities even if you even if, if you trade an altcoin into ethereum that's a capital gains event so you don't want you want to be very careful in terms of holding your tax liabilities that you have to pay in these crypto assets because what i inevitably see each cycle is people hold their assets in Ethereum, and then we'll get a bear market right before tax season, and they're planning to pay their taxes out of out of the out of their portfolio. So if you're planning to pay your taxes in Ethereum, and Ethereum drops 50%, you've effectively doubled the taxes that you have to pay. So it can leave people in a really precarious position in, in that regard. But the longer you hold the crypto asset, if you hold it over 365 days, you do get a more preferable tax rate. But when you're when you're taking profits on an asset, you want to keep in mind that if you're having gains, you want to try to pull those out into USD, so you're not exposing your your tax payments to validity risk. So it looks like timing is is everything, oh, and yeah. it's very nuanced, right? So the, oh, this yeah. is all eye opening for me, and I'm sure for our listeners here too. Um, now, is there any limit? right is there a minimum threshold for reporting uh cryptocurrency and is it are we only taxed when we exit um so no there isn't a minimum for reporting you want to you want to report regardless and um it's also 
interesting that you bring that up because a lot of people in years that they have losses, they'll think, I don't have to do my accounting. I don't have to report. You still want to do your accounting on a yearly basis, even if you have losses and you still want to report the losses. You don't want to like sort of let this get out of hand and have to come to my firm and we're doing four or five years of your accounting and taxes, which you'd be surprised how common that is. Um, but there, there isn't a threshold for reporting. You want to you want to report any taxable transaction that you have. Now, if they come under a certain, you know, under your standard deduction, for instance, they may not be taxed, but you still need to report it. Um, so, so yeah, you basically um, always, always need to report. Got you. Um, and, you know, Patrick, this is going to be a little bit of a, we're going to continue on. Um, I want to get it deeper into kind of the, the tools that are being used um, best practices for our listeners and okay. ourselves uh, as crypto investors. Um, I want to definitely get into NFTs because I think there are going to be a lot of uh, hair raising uh, oh, yeah. going on come uh, tax season around NFTs and the, the, the rapid trading and, and buying and selling of NFTs that's been going on. We have so much to unpack. Um, I appreciate you being here. Where and again, we're gonna. This is gonna be a, a series um, that we're gonna kind of dig into. Much more to get into with you uh, for sure. Where can our listeners get a hold of you uh, and yes. perhaps ask more questions and you know maybe utilize your services? Absolutely. So I'm you know I'm pretty much on every social media platform. The best place to get a hold of me is to go to my website, which is camusocpa.com, and you can go to the contact us page. Fill, fill that out and one of my team members will reach out to you and we would get on a call directly and discuss your fact pattern in detail. Other than that, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, basically across the social media platforms. If you look up my name, I should be there. And, you know, for our listeners, we'll have uh, um, Patrick's information and Camuso uh, CPA information linked below. Um, again, Stay tuned for, for new episodes around crypto reporting and accounting. Um, Patrick, thank you so much. I know, you know, you've got to run. I've got to run. We'll be back together soon. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you a lot.